Good afternoon, one and all. Thanks for coming. This afternoon, our AY is entitled God in All Seasons. Please enjoy. Afternoon, everybody. We'd like to thank you for tuning in this evening to our AY. Let's pray. Dear God, as you go into this virtual AY, bless those that are home sitting behind the screen. Bless that we will be blessed, dear Lord. They will walk away with something to renew them, to give them hope in this pandemic. In Jesus' name, amen. Good afternoon, and I would like to say welcome to our AY Youth District program. Welcome to the whole Southwestern Division, church families, families sitting at home, well wishers, and we don't want to forget, especially the young children. We are glad that you tuned in this evening to enjoy our program and hope that you are richly blessed by what we have to offer. Welcome.
Good afternoon, AY. Our text for contemplation this afternoon will be taken from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. And it reads, Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort all long-suffering and doctrine. May the Lord add his blessing to the hearers of his word. Call upon him when the chill breeze hits your shoulder. Winter's here, your heart feels colder. Call upon him if the leaves in your life are too brown. All anxiety and fears pull you under. He'll save you before you drown. Call upon him if things are just too hot. Burning in anger, your minds are all blurred. He's here beside you. Don't miss your spot. Call upon him, even when things are bright. You can thank him enough for sharing his light. When you're broken and feel all alone, he is yours. He'll pick you up and take you home. When you're needing and wanting, there is something you're missing. Ask the Savior. He is giving. God is the creator of now and then. So call him in all seasons. You can't have a better friend. Good evening. My name is Jensen Alexander. I'm a farmer from the Coromandel Seventh day Adventist Church. My production is cocoa, citrus, and other fruit scraps. Today I'm going to focus on cocoa. You know, since we are going through this COVID season, in our spiritual journey also, we will find ourselves at some point in time going through some different seasons. Sometimes it will be good, sometimes it will be bad. Sometimes we will be restricted, just like the plants. You know, in the early stage of a plant's life, it is young, it is, it is not very strong, it has to be nurtured, like this cocoa tree. At one point, it was very small, like one of these, like one of these trees, it was very small. But then it grew and it and it was nourished and it grew to be a healthy cocoa tree. Now, for this cocoa tree to be productive, it goes through a period of time. So let's call it the different seasons in which it goes through. Cocoa bears six months of the year and the other six months it shed its leaves whereby it can regain its strength. So now, Cocoa production will start from the month of September, October, November, December, 
January, February. And during March and April, you might get some because the tree, how it is operating, has some more nutrients and it can produce flowers and young cocoa like these, which is called Cheryl's, before you get a complete pod like this that produces cocoa. So, let me give you a little story here. For you to grow as a Christian and to enjoy what God has in store for you, you must first have buds. You must give, but and then you must blossom. And then as you are about to grow spiritually, you will turn into a little sherub. Like the cocoa tree, you will produce. And as you grow daily, as you grow spiritually daily, you will bear fruit. And from this fruit, you will get what we call cocoa beans. That where you enjoy chocolate and a lot of chocolate delights. Or you can enjoy it by just sucking it. Sweet, has a nice flavor, is good for you. In your spiritual journey, always remember you cannot grow spiritually without feeding on the word of God so that you will produce good fruit and when you produce good fruit you will be able to share that fruit with others I'm saying to you there is a time and a season for everything there's a time when you get flowers there's a time when you get a Cheryl. There's a time when you get a mature cocoa. And there's a time when you get a ripe cocoa that brings forth fruit. So always remember in your spiritual growth, there are different seasons that you would be able to enjoy the fruits of your nature. The fruits that God has given to you. Not every time you will be able to produce plenty fruits or plenty flowers but at least you are producing based on how your spirituality is based on how you grow as you grow spiritually day by day as you continue to live for Jesus day by day as you continue to feed on his word day by day in each season God will bless you that you will produce much fruit Good afternoon, church. My name is Melanie Maxwell, and today I'm going to tell you a story about David and Goliath. There was a boy named David, and he was brave. So brave that he killed a bear and a lion to protect his father's sheep. But one day, he heard that his brothers was going to battle with the Philistines. David was so excited that he went to his father and said, Father, I am willing to go and fight with my brothers for Israel. They laughed at him. David, you little... <laughs> Don't worry, <laughs> They laughed at him. David, you have to stay here and look after father's sheep. David was so disappointed. But later, but later, his, fa his father named Jesse was worried about him. So he called David and said, David, go and, go and carry food for your brothers and come back with great news. So when David arrived, arrived, he heard a great laugh. Ha 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 He saw that the Israelite army was running. He, he knew, but when he looked up, he saw a great giant called Goliath. He said, none of the soldiers of Israel is going to fight this giant. Well, I'm going to. So he brought the food to his brothers and went to King Saul. And he said, King Saul, I am willing to fight for Israel. 
So King Saul, so King Saul told the soldiers to bring my armor for the little boy. But there were one, but there were one problem. The armor was too big. So he told King Saul, "Don't worry. I will go to the stream and get five smooth stones." So he did. And when he arrived to the battle, Dave, Goliath looked down and said, Ha ha ha, you come with me with sticks and stones? You think I'm a dog? But David said, You come with me with swords and shields, but I come with the name of the Lord. So, so Goliath ran to David. David quickly take, took one stone, put it in a slingshot, and threw and swung it around his head. One, two, three, and let it go. The stone went flying in the air, hit Goliath in his forehead, and Goliath fell to the ground. Boom! David went up on him, took his sword, and chopped off his neck. The Philistines were afraid. Let's get out of here. He, they ran and never returned. The Israelite was happy because of David's braveness. So the moral of the story, boys and girls, wherever you go and bad times come, just remember in your heart that Jesus is always by your side. The end. And welcome to our AY program this afternoon and happy Sabbath to one and all, all the viewers. Happy Sabbath to you and welcome. Today we have an interesting topic to discuss. It's common, but yet interesting. We are speaking about God in everything. Yes, what did I say? God manifesting himself, himself in everything everything our daily life and with me to endorse this wonderful topic i have two beautiful women seventh day adventist women women of the cloth women who will di divulge truth to you all here on my left i have sister white did I get it correct? Yes, Sister White. Nicole White. I, I was about to say Sister E.G. White, but it's Nicole White, and she is a member of the Aripero SDA Church. Welcome, Sister Nicole, to our panel. And on my left, we have our dear sister, Sister Dina Williams. Yes, she also attend the Sobo SDA Church, but she resides at Aripero, and I heard that she came from San Susi. That's another story, but welcome to our panel, Sister Dina. Thank you. Yes, because of time, we have to get right into the meat of the matter, and uh, as I said before, a God in all seasons. That's our topic for this afternoon. Sister Dina, you have studied this wonderful woman of the Bible. And offset you were sharing how wonderful the, the knowledge that you gained th through the power of the Holy Spirit about this woman that you would like to share for us. Sister White, you also studied about a wonderful woman in the Bible. And you would also like to share what the Holy Spirit has impressed on your mind. But before we, cut, we get to these wonderful topics, we like to bow our heads and say a prayer. We like to ask the Holy Spirit to come take control. Dear loving Father, we praise you and we magnify the most holy name. Thanking you for this opportunity where we can share with your people your wonderful love, God, in all seasons. Father, take control of our life, life even at this time. Take away self. Humble us, Lord Father, so when we open our mouth, we can speak of your love and you and you alone will be praised. 
Thank you for your love. Forgive us for all our sins. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, Sister Dana, the woman that you studied was Hagar. Yes, Hagar. Hagar of the Bible. That's Hagar with Sarah and Abraham. That very one. Ooh. Can we ask you, what season was Sega going through at that, at that time when she lived with Abraham and Sarah? Sira? Well, Hagar went through a lot, right? We can find the story of Hagar in uh, Genesis chapter 16 from verses 1 to 16. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you something. Eh? While studying this, I realized that the story of Hagar is one we usually gloss over in the Bible. One that um, we don't pay any significance to as it relates to Hagar herself, but rather Abraham and Sarah. But I had a chance to study this from Hagar's point of view. And I... I found so much that I actually fell in love with this story. <laughs> um, we were talking before and you, you all realized how much I talk because I, I never saw so much in, in, in the story of Hagar before. And um, so the story goes that Abraham and Sarah were promised a child. Yes. Um, they were barren for years. Um, they were promised a child. And... They took matters into their own hands to have this child because they thought that God was staying too long. Hmm. All right? Um, and I think that probably happens to a lot of couples um, today as well. Yes. However, um, Sarah had a handmaid called Hagar. And she took this handmaid to Abraham and said, lie with her and she would have a child um, by me. Okay, um, chap in verses 4 tells us that Hagar conceived. Yes. Hagar conceived and she despised her mistress, right? Now, I think when we look at that, I've heard so many Christians talk about it and say, um, Sarah, be um, Hagar, sorry, became pompous and all of that, right? But didn't she have a right to? And, and, and I said this, and I'll go back a little bit, right? All th throughout this story so far, Hagar was just a slave, a foreigner, because she was Egyptian, not of God's chosen people, and a slave. Okay. Right? A slave. Someone who took the commands of others. Someone who didn't even have control over her own body. They made a decision and she had to go with it. She couldn't say no. It was not a, a request. Right? It was not a request. She couldn't say no. She had no control over her own body. And now, she's in a position where something that you wanted, I now have. Something you wanted, I now have. You don't have it. So maybe Sarah came and asked Hagar to do something. And Hagar probably said, I'm with child, do it yourself. <laughs> that could have been a conversation, right? That could have been a conversation we don't know. But that could have been. It, 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 I mean, when, we, when we're looking at scenarios today, that could have played off very easily, right? Um, so this was the first time in her life she felt some importance. She felt some self-worth. Then, um, in chap in, sorry, not chapter, but verse 5, Sarah goes to Abraham and say, my wrong be upon thee, because now she knows that she was wrong, because first of all, there was, okay, um, we might say infidelity or fornication happening in the marriage, right? Sin, right? Because there should have been no third party. It may have been common in those days if a woman couldn't get pregnant or couldn't conceive that 
they would give their handmaid, but that doesn't make it right, even if it was God's chosen people. Just to um, object a little bit there, um, in those days, polygamy probably was something common within the non-Christian, I should say, nation, right? The Philistines, Moabites, or whatever. And, and as you said, it's not something that supposed to present itself within the Israelite camp. That's Abraham and they. Um, and we are seeing this thing happening. Was, he, was Hagar, Hagar sorry, forced by any means or because of her living situation and a condition she had to accept? It? That's what you are sharing with us? I'm saying that her position was one where she was a slave. She did not have a say. T take it now we we are looking at this from the from the point of view of god's chosen people so we're thinking she probably had a say because god's chosen people was nice <laughs> but when we when we look at the africans mm -hmm. who were here as slaves right and so many of the women were raped true did they have a say in that this is akin to rape. She had no say. This, this, this is what I'm saying. Do you think that Hagar would have been there saying, um, looking at 86-year-old Abraham and saying, um, oh gosh, I wish I could sleep with you, boy? Hmm. Oh, Lord. That would not have been going through her mind. Right? right but so. it was a practice in those days yes, it because was. there was a stigma attached to a woman who couldn't have a child That's because right. at that time that was it if you couldn't have a child then what was your purpose right, as a so. woman right so so it's something that they did but it was not right okay so so moving on to um to what happened now after that um, Abraham actually gave Sarah free reign to do whatever she wanted to Hagar. Right? Do what you want. So to interject, um, mm -hmm. Sister Williams, are you saying that um, Abraham and Sarah used Hagar, more or less? But definitely. Yeah. In fact, if you look at the verses so far, they never used Hagar's name. They didn't see Hagar as a person per se. They saw her based on her position, what she can do for them. Or, or, was, it, or was it that, uh, because I've, I've heard this come out of already, was it that Abraham had loved his wife so much that he just wanted to make her happy? So he allowed his hand Maybe. maiden to be used. And then of course, you know like what men usually say, they can't please women. Um, so he allowed that to happen, and then when she was with child after, Sarah still was not pleased. Was it a situation like that, do you think? So for me, that couldn't be. If you're in a marriage, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what. How does a third party come in? Right. Why did the third party come in? It doesn't matter if you that's what your wife wanted. What did God say about that right. and about that sin? And then, so that says something here. It's saying that uh, basically um, Abraham was not at the place he was supposed to be with God. Well, n well neither of them because they wanted yeah. to rush the process anyhow, mm -hmm. right? But moving on. So, um, so then we, we see after verse 5, we see that, um, that um, Hagar fled. Right? right? Hagar yes. fled. But before she fled, if, if we really look at what the Bible said, it says, And when Sarai dead, dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. Hmm. Now, she was already a slave. Now she was oppressed even more. True. Right? Now she was oppressed even more because Sarai was upset now because the relational dialectic between them had now changed. True. So, so now she was very upset and she was oppressing her even more because of that. And if you think she wasn't oppressing her, she was, right? The same word that is used here to talk about, um, about oppression is the same word that was used to talk about how the Hebrews was afflicted by the Egyptians. Same word, right? So, so moving on, she fled. 
But verse 7 is so, so good. Verse 7 says, And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness. Praise the Lord. For the verse to say, have found her, implies looking for her. That's right. Somebody who was not sure of God's chosen people. But God sent an angel to look for her. To look for her. To pursue her. That is so significant. Somebody who we saw as a slave of low position, a foreigner, somebody who had to run away because she was afflicted so much. God looked for her. That's he sent right. an angel. That's and the right. angel found her. Right? And, and that, is, that, that is so significant in, for all our lives today. And in verse 8, he says, Hagar. Full stop, eh? He called her by her name for the first time here in this whole scenario. She's called by her name, not her position, handmaid, slave. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. She's called by her name for the first time. By so who? She's now recognized by God. 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 Mm-hmm. Right? He calls her by name. Right? And, and, and she was asked two questions, two pertinent questions. She was asked where you came from and where you're going. And the only one she could have responded to was where, where she, she came, came from. from. She did not know where she was going because she left a situation where she could die. She had no expected end. Right? She didn't see a future. However, now she could because... The, the angel of the Lord told her to go back. And the angel of the Lord told her that he will multiply her seed exceedingly. So not only was the child who, would, who was the other child who would come out of Abraham and, Sa- and, and Sarah going to be blessed exceedingly, but her child as well. Oh yes, oh yes. Her child was going to be blessed exceedingly as well. More than all and, seasons. Yes, and, and the thing is, um, it goes on to say, well, to call his name, his name would have been Ishmael, right? And if I'm not mistaken, I did research, I am trying to remember, I think it means God who hears, okay. right? Not only that, but the Bible says in verse 12, and he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man, and against every man's hand would be against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren, and some of you may think this is not something you would, this is not how you would like to, to be characterized by God. But for Hagar, this was a special thing because it means that he would never be a slave. Okay. He would never be a slave. He would never be oppressed. He would not be bridled, right? Um, people would not be able to control him. So through him, she had a lot of freedom now. Right, so 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 while we may think that's not something I would want God to say of me, that was such a powerful thing for her situation, right? And 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 let me say this: there are many people. We're turning it into today's situation. There are so many people today who are going through things. Young ladies today, young men today, who are going through so much, and you may think that. Um. God is a God who delays. God is a God who is never on time. God is a God who not hearing you. There are so many things that you may think God answers one is in his own time. Because time for God is different for true. time for true. us. So true. Right? But you may think, one... I am an outcast. Nobody wants me. I made a mistake. I got pregnant. And my family don't want me. My friends don't want me. Didn't the same thing just happen to Hagar? Yes, that's right. But God found her. Of Amen. course. Amen. Right? She was, en- she was a slave. You might be enslaved in sin. But God could actually take you out of that position. That's right. Because God gives us a future and an expected end. So while we may see the position that we are in, God sees what we could be, which is so very important for any season that you might be in today. And if you don't take anything away from this, I want you to take that away, that 
God is a God of all seasons. God sees because the Bible said that the Lord had heard the affliction. Yes, that's right? right. So if you think that she wasn't afflicted or oppressed, the Bible actually said in verse 11 that she would have a son and call him Ishmael because the Lord had seen her affliction. The Lord sees your affliction too. He knows what you're going through. He sees and he hears and he will do something about it. Amen. 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 So at this moment, hold your seat. We'll be right back after this special wonderful music. Ship 
weapons batter. Thank God the anchor holds, though the sails are torn. Okay, welcome back. Hope you enjoyed that wonderful music rendered unto you. If you are now joining us, the topic is a God in all seasons. And we have just discussed Hagar. I would like to ask you something. The Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. So things that had happened, have ha happened in the past and in Bible times are now happening now. Um... This may be difficult, but if you and your spouse, you're newly married and everything, and you are unable to have a child at this time, would you consider artificial insemination? And I would also like to ask, um, what, what is your take on the church stand on artificial insemination? The first one first. Okay. Well, first of all, as you can see, But um, aside from that, um, artificial insemination, um, well, two things. One, artificial insemination or any of the assisted medical procedures when it comes to reproduction should be between um, the couple, the married couple, a man and his wife, right? Okay. Not any external forces, right? Um, they shouldn't feel that they're pressured to do it right. just because society says that is what a family should be they should have a child and that type of thing that's that's one um even though there's a stigma attached to them not having a child and all of that in some societies so that's one two if any of those things are being considered they must be considered within the confines of the marriage as God dictated, all right? Because um, with artificial insemination, you have, or it's not just artificial insemination. We have a, a few others, right? But um, for instance, I, I have no problem with artificial insemination as it relates to, um, let's say, a couple may be having some problems. Um, they have been trying for a while, but they realize that they probably need some help. So they both go in to get tested, and they realize, okay, one of the parties has a problem. Let's just say it's the male. Um, and, and by the way, research has shown that 40% of the time, it's the male. Right, we usually look and say it's the female because we're not seeing the female um, carrying a, a belly, right? Mm -hmm. However, forty percent of the time it's actually the male. Um, I'm not saying fault because it's not a fault, yeah. right? We we may look at it as a fault, but it's not a fault. It may be a medical problem, yeah. right? Okay. Um, it could be a mental problem as well, or a mental block or something like that. So so um, so they go in. And let's say it's male factor, where the male might have a low sperm count or um, the mobility of the sperm to get to the egg might be in question. So what may happen is they may have some sperm um, in the lab, wash the sperm, 
and then they would inject it into the uterus so that the cervical mucus wouldn't be a barrier to the sperm actually getting to the egg, okay. right? So, um, <laughs> you make me laugh. So, so um, the, the, the sperm gets to the egg really easily. Yes. And um, especially when the woman is most fertile, right? right? Um, so the chances of conception are bet- um, is better. I have no problem with that. I don't really see an ethical dilemma in, uh, with that. There are many people who do who say, if God wanted you to have a child, he would have let you have a child in a natural way and, and all of that. Okay. Then we can answer with um, like saying something like, so God never intended people to get ill either. And there are many people, even in the church, who get cancer and different diseases and stuff like that. But because of medical advances, um, longevity will be added to the years. Right? They may be able to manage um, a, a disease or a virus or something better. Right? Um, they may be able to totally eradicate the disease from their body. Yes. Right? So I have no problem with using medical and technological advances as long as it stays within the confines of the marriage as God dictated. Sure. However, when we come to third party, that is where I have a problem because there are a lot of ethical considerations that would come up, right? For instance, when we have sperm donors, that's where I think I would have a problem. Not I think I would have a problem because we're introducing a third party. You're talking about genetics that is not um, yours, right? It's the genetics. Um, it, it's not your husband's child, right? Or, or there is also... Um, they, there, there would be also times when it's both the egg and the sperm that's not from the husband or the wife, but it's inserted into the uterus. Okay, right? so sister, what you are saying and what I, I am getting from the conversation here is that once the, the conception is, is done by, between the male and the female or the married the couple... Yeah where there's no external involvement, this will be accepted now, by... No, there is external involvement in well, terms in, of the lab. Yes, well, in, right? term, in terms of the donation of the... But the donation yeah. is where I have the problem. Right. The donation comes from a third party. A third party. That's when the donation it. comes from a third party. We also have things like surrogacy and all of that, where it's yeah. a third party involved. And that's more like Hagar's situation there. Right. Um, well, still, well, they <laughs> slept together. That was big infidelity or, or um, um, fornication or adultery, adultery in the marriage. That was, that was, yeah. that was, it's, it was still different. But there are people who um, even on television shows, you see it sometimes, where they'll go to sleep with a friend. They, they yes, actually yes. get permission mm-hmm. to go sleep with a friend so that they could have a child. No, it's wrong. That shouldn't be within the confines of the marriage. Yeah. That's right? So outrageous. that's where I have the problem when we involve third party in the marriage. So I guess what about the, the church stands on it? I mean, this is not a topic that is broadly discussed um, I think this is the first time I have discussed this topic on a platform, but what do you think is the Seventh-day Adventist stands on the artificial insemination, right. but between the married couple? Well, I did do some research on it, and the church, um, the church does say it is between the married couple, and there should be no part, um, third party involvement as well. Praise the Lord. There should be no third party. Praise right? the Lord. Praise, Praise the Lord. So we would like to thank Sister Williams for that lovely information that she has shared with us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And because we are pressed for time, we cannot get more out of her. But God is good. We may have another session of this. But we would like to move to Sister White here. Sister White, pleasant afternoon again. And um, you have studied Esther, and we would like to ask you the same question that we have asked Sister Williams there. What, what, is, what is your understanding of Esther's um, situation and um, her, her season that she went through, where Christ was with her throughout the journey? What is your, uh, your take? Okay, so good evening to everyone. 
And the Jessa's sister, Williams, said that she was so marveled and in awe by the story of Hagar. I myself was very much marveled by the story of Esther. I mean, this is something, this is a story I would have been hearing about for years, you know, but actually studying it from Esther's perspective and, you know, um, delving deep into the story. You know, I got so much from it. So, first of all, um, Esther came from very unfortunate, uh, an unfortunate past where she lost her both parents, True. right? And uh, um, she was raised more or less by her uncle's, by her uncle's son, right, who was her cousin. And um, we see here that Esther didn't use that as an excuse to go against God, to do as she, she wanted, right? Instead, she was, she was very humble. She was very, very, very humble. We see Esther here as a team player, because mm -hmm. we see a lot of teamwork between her and Mordecai. Yes. Right? They work together to achieve what God wanted them to achieve. Of course. Right? Um, I'm seeing a young, beautiful, uh, faithful woman of God here. Right? And um, I am seeing where she, she may not have known um, what was her anointing, but she definitely had a relationship with God, a deep relationship with God. Yes. Right? And because of that, God was able to use her, right, in a, in a marked way as a leader. You know, um, I was so excited reading this story. Um, and just seeing that Esther just did as the Holy Spirit led her to do. And for me, I'm thinking that she didn't even know. She didn't know it was going to be such a, a big story at the end. Yes. Because it's, it's a short book, but it's a very big story. Of course. Yeah. yeah? <laughs> so, um, you know, I see this story as a, a story that we can learn from even today. You know, um, it's a story where we, we can pull out of it that uh, we need to be faithful to God. We need to have that deep relationship with him. We need to trust him even when we don't understand what the outcome may be. We still need to trust him because Esther could have died. Yes. She took a chance with her life. But, you know, she didn't just take any chance she took a chance with god that's right right, that's right. and this is what uh, is most important for for that time and for the time that we live in right every day we take chances yes. right just walk stepping out of our home is taking a chance every decision we make is taking a chance but taking a chance with god is it's worth taking that chance yes as we can see from coming out from this story Thank you, Sister White. Um, Sister White, as we have said, God in all seasons. And you have said that Esther was faithful yes. to God and he led. That chance that she took to go before the king yes. was led by the Holy Spirit. You know, looking in our day and time in the 21st century with those beautiful women like yourself, Esther herself was a beautiful woman. She had the opportunity to, be, opportunity to be among men who had earthly power. She could have gotten anything she wanted, right? This is a season that a lot of young women desire. Most females love to look good, shop, be among the popular crowd. However, Esther stayed faithful to God during her season of blessings. And she was extremely blessed. Yeah. Would you agree? She used this opportunity to help to hold God's people together. And that's amazing. And, and that, that was something that um, jumped out at me in this story. Yes. You know, sometimes when we get wealth and we get publicity, we tend to turn our backs on people, you know, on our people. Right? right? And Esther didn't do that. She remembered her people. She fought for her people 
in prayer. She commanded her people. You know, she acted as a leader. Yes. And, and what was amazing about it as well, she didn't just command her people to pray and fast. She also commanded her maidens to do the same. Yes, and and to yes. me, that was amazing, right? Um, even if they probably didn't believe or understand, but she commanded them to do the same as her, to follow her. That's right. Right? That's right. And God wants us as women to be leaders as well, right? And also, he wants us to, to know when to speak know when to use our testimonies because so many so many of us as women go through so much we go through a lot um sometimes i think that we go through more than men <laughs> right yeah, yeah we do yeah, yeah. and uh, and you know god is saying to us uh, know when to, to be silent mm -hmm. and know when to speak know when to to, to use your testimony Right, because he know he knows the time that is is going to be beneficial to not just ourselves but to others. Right. right. True. So, in everything that we do, we need to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. Of course. So, um, Sister Nicola, do you think that that is um, what differentiated her from Vashti? And yeah, definitely. Right, because um, as I as I was saying before, you know, um, she used tact. And as, as women of God, we need to use tact in everything, in our marriages, in everything. Because Esther could have gone about it a different way. You know, she could have just go to, to her husband and, and say, well, you know, these are my people and I'm your wife now and you have to do this. And yeah, she didn't it's do true. that. No, no she right? didn't do that. She moved silently. She approached the throne of God and she moved with tact. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe that is what made her so vastly different from Vashti. Sister White, um, looking at the 21st century and the young ladies that we have in our society, even in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, um, I would like to ask you this. Is it possible for a young woman to attain wealth, popularity, and still serve God at 100%? Well, I will say definitely yes. I would say yes. I, I would say that you need to have a, a deep relationship with God because it's very easy to slip into that um, self mode. Mm -hmm. you know, and money does that for you. Money does that publicity. You know, well does that. Yes. Right? Um, so we need to have a deep relationship with God and we need to know what our blessings are for. Is it just for us? Or is it for the advancement of the kingdom of God? Okay. Right, so I believe, yes, you can be, but you, you, you need to know yourself and you need to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. True. Well, probably um, a young person or woman may have obtained a land and house and other riches and you know they manage it well to the honor and glory of God. But Sister Williams, should should a woman or an Adventist woman living in the last days looking forward for the coming of Christ seek riches? First of all, what is riches? Or what do you determine riches to be? Mm -hmm. Because a person could be rich in many different things, right? Money isn't always akin to being rich, right? And wealth, wealth and money are two different things. True. Right? right? You could have a lot of wealth, but not hard cash, right? So, um, so, so, so we have to look at what we think riches. Um, what we think riches are and and then again um should we seek it right should we um actively seek to be rich um listen 
The fact is that there is nothing wrong with having wealth. There is nothing wrong with having riches. There is nothing wrong with having it all. You've, you went to school, you worked hard, um, you did what, whatever uh, um, as it relates to the confines of God, your relationship yes. with God. And you've, um, you've achieved things and you've accumulated wealth. There is nothing wrong with that. In fact, if you're poor, you can't help anybody. And as God's people, I believe we ought to have. Yes. It, it doesn't mean that everybody would have. The Bible says the poor will always be with yes. us, right? However, we are supposed to have. There's nothing wrong with that. A lot of times when we talk about riches and wealth, we, we talk about it in terms of um, if you have it, you're not going to love God and you're not going to want God. And I, I actually don't believe that at all because yes. we've seen many of his people in the Bible who had a lot. They had a lot. They, they traded and, and they did so much. And if you, if you look at their wealth in comparison to wealth today, you would have seen how much they really had. So there's nothing wrong with having it. Um, seeking it is what you ask me if we should actively seek yes. just to have it yes. right? and I think it's not about seeking, seeking wealth um, seeking a relationship with God um, and, and um, a lot of times a byproduct of that is wealth well if, yes. I, if I may interject this is what came out of the story because I do not believe that Esther seeked Richard, she didn't no, see it. She didn't know this is this this was going to be yes. the outcome. Her, her outcome. And even for Mordecai, mm -hmm. look at the outcome for him. And I don't believe that that was something that they were seeking, but they were faithful to God, yeah. right? He so blessed he blessed them, and he he knew they went through very unfortunate times in their lives, and he knew that they were not ready to handle wealth. Right, so well, speaking about wealth, we would like to thank these ladies for the spiritual wealth of knowledge that we have just received. Right, um, we'd like to th take a look at Josiah in the book Second Kings, chapter 22, verse 2 and onwards. We have learned that Josiah began to reign in Jerusalem at age eight was a very young king, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. At this point in time, he walked in all the ways of the Lord. He turned neither to the left or to the right, the Bible said, right? And Josiah decided at one point in time of his life that he wanted to honor God. He didn't want to live or lead God's people the way that his grandfather Manasseh did. And by which Josiah asks Shavon, Shafan is the proper pronunciation, to go to the priest to disperse some monies, we will say in those days, silver, between those that have worked in the temple because they have done a very good job. When he went there, the priest gave him a, a book to read. And when Shaphan read this, he melted. And he carried this to Josiah and read it to him. These were the laws of God. When Josiah read these things, he rent his clothes and fell on the ground. Because he knew that what, he, what they were doing as a nation was against God. Jerusalem was in idolatry. They had other gods. They had groves. They have had a lot of things worshipping. They sacrificed uh, um, children to these idols. They have done wickedly against God. But Josiah, being moved by the Holy Spirit, decided that he will take a stand for God. I have to rush through the, the story because of time, but at the end, Josiah decided to break down all of the idols, cast them away. 
he went and stood in a high place to read the book, the law, to God's people so they can return to their maker. Josiah, being a young man, was led greatly by God. And because of this, God promised that when his judgment were to fall on Jerusalem, Josiah will not be part of this and he would not experience this destruction. Today, ladies and gentlemen, as Josiah, Hagar, Abraham, Esther, these individuals were led greatly by God because they yielded their self to God. I want to share to you, I want to say to you also, that even though you are going through situations that make you feel like giving up or casting down the towel, I would like to share and say, keep your faith and your eyes fixed on Jesus. He is the God of the past, he is the God of the present, and he will be the God of the future, God in all seasons. Sister Williams and Sister White, what la closing remarks you all would like to leave with our viewers before we, we wrap this up? Well, uh, you just spoke about Josiah, so um, I, I probably want to um, say something about Josiah. In verses 8 um, of chapter 22, it says, um, Shaphan the scribe, mm -hmm. he went to, um, he, um, it says, and Hilkiah the high priest said unto Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan and he read it. Yes. That same word found again implying that something was lost. Yes. The book of the law was lost in the house of the Lord. Mercy. That's a big thing. How could the book of the law be lost in the house of the Lord? It means that um, they went so contrary to God's law for so long that they yes. forgot that that book was there. True. Let, Let not, not that be us where the book of God is lost in our oh, houses. Amen. So true. Because there are many times these books may be on our shelves taking up cobwebs. When we're actually supposed to be reading, when we're actually supposed to be reading these books, when we're actually supposed to be reading the Bible, reading the books of the Bible, gaining knowledge for such a time as this, right? Because we are in the last days, we're in the toenail of time, and we're seeing so many things fulfilling, yet so many of us are sleeping. It's time for Laodicea to wake up. Because if we don't, what does God say in his word? He will spew us out. Because we think, we think we have so much, but we don't have. We're not hot, we're not cold. We're rich, you know, in that we do know the word, that we do have the prophecy, but we're so poor because we're actually not reading and we do not really have a connection with God. Because if we do have a connection with him, we would see that we're in the last days. We don't have a lot of time. And because we don't have a lot of time, this is the only way, reading this is the only way we'll know what time it is. Because God never does anything without actually telling us this. That's right. right. That's right. So, so we need to read. We need to read. We need to stay current. We need to we need to listen to the news. Right? We need to, to see what's going on out there because a lot of what may be happening in the last days this time wouldn't be happening here but elsewhere. Of course. So we need to actually pay attention to what is going on. Read and watch read and watch because the time is really close at hand.
Amen. Yes, and there's a great personal commitment that we need to have a relationship with God because in Prophet and Kings chapter 33 and emphasize how Manasseh deliberately hid the book yes. of, of, of yes. God, the law of God, and the people I would have said was dependent on the king to lead them and they were led astray. Yes. We can depend on our pastors alone to lead us. We need God to lead us. And we, as the Bible says, work out your salvation. Work out your own salvation with prayer and trembling. And Sister White, what, what closing remarks you would like to give to us? Okay, so I would like to speak to the young woman. I would like to say it's not where you came from. You might have come from some unfortunate past, just like Esther, just like Hagar. But God has a plan and a purpose for your life. And once you stay faithful to him, once you have that deep connection and that deep relationship with him, he will take you where you can't even imagine to be. So continue to trust him and continue to stay faithful to him. Put aside self and put him first. Well, thank you, Sister Williams, and thank you, Sister White, for, Thanks for having us. Thank being you. part of this panel. Well, guys, sorry we are out of time. We could have done so many things, but next time we will be with you all. God in all seasons. Make God your first. Make God your all in this season as we look forward for his second coming. Have a Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, EYs. Good afternoon, everyone, wherever you are viewing. It is indeed a privilege to share God's word with you this evening. And uh, the theme for this evening's devotion is God in all seasons. God is in all seasons. And uh, I'm happy and delighted this evening to talk to you about a God that is in all seasons. So matter for this evening, I want to allow God to speak to you through me. Amen. Loving God, this evening I submit myself to you, O Lord. Come Holy Spirit and speak through me to your people. Say what you want to say, O Lord, and let your will be done in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, this evening, I want to let you know about a God who is in all season. As a matter of fact, one of my favorite passages in the Bible that speaks about seasons is found in the book Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Yes? And Ecclesiastes chapter 3 begins by saying, To everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. Yes, my friends, you realize that as we live our lives on a daily basis, things happen. Incidents occur. We have different experiences every moment of our lives. And I just want to remind you that whatever the season, whatever the experience, God is in everything. Hallelujah. The Bible continues, it says in verse 2, there is a time to be born yes God is responsible for life and being born yes and a time to die indeed he is the one who takes back his breath after you die the breath goes back to God and the body goes back to the earth hallelujah it says a time to plant and when we plant ladies and gentlemen that's all we can do put it in the ground water it and wait and then god does a wonderful miracle with the seed yes it begins to shoot and bud into a wonderful plant a time to pluck what was planted yes and then you get fruit and then it's god that gives you the strength to reap and to gain wealth from what you had planted and now it says that there's a time to kill now, I don't want you to take this out of context because we are remaining in God's word in his context. He says, thou shalt not commit murder. 
But in his word, he had given privilege to take the life of certain animals that would be used for food. Amen? That would be used for food. There's clean and unclean. And he says, use those that would be used for food. A time to heal. Hallelujah. And indeed, God is a healer. Yes? God is a healer. And he is able to heal your diseases. He's able to heal your heartaches. He's able to heal even our country. He said, I will heal your land if you humble yourselves and seek my face and turn from your wicked ways. He will heal our land. And you might be wondering, does this relate to the pandemic that we are going through, COVID-19? Uh, no doubt, ladies and gentlemen, God is able to make something good out of what is happening right now. And he knows the end from the beginning and he will heal our land. And, and, and the passage goes on and on and letting us know that uh, different experiences that we experience from time after time, God is in every season. As we go forward, I just want to remind you that there's, there's a wonderful passage out of find in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33 that says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all things shall be added to you. I just want to tell you this evening that God is interested in every aspect of your life. God is interested in your prosperity. God is interested in your financial, your physical, your emotional life. God is interested in your material life. He is interested in adding all things to you. Of course, there is a priority, as we saw earlier. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We will get back to that. But I want to let you know that as you go forth in life, seeking the other things in life, seeking the material things in life, seeking the financial things in life, seeking the social and the material things in life, do not fail to allow God to be in everything that you do. Do not fail to allow God to be in every aspect of your business. Do not fail to allow God to be in every social relationship that you engage in. God is in every season and once he is there, you can be assured of victory. You can be assured of being safe and security. You can be assured of experiencing the good that he has for you. Hallelujah. But ladies and gentlemen, more than that, our Bible tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 4, and here is where our responsibility as, as God's church comes in. As young people, here is where our responsibility comes in. As light bearers for God, here is where our responsibility comes in. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2 says, and I want you to listen carefully to these words, these instructions for us. It says, preach the word. Hallelujah. Are you hearing me this evening? Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Hallelujah. Be ready in season and out of season. Yes. Now God's word is so important that he wants us to share it. He says preach, convince, teach, exhort everyone. And most important this evening as the word goes out, as we carry God's word, uh, I want you to understand that those of you who are listening, wherever you are listening, that the Bible says that now is the time, today is the day of salvation. This is the season of salvation. And now is the time to take your salvation seriously. Now is the time to make your calling an election sure. Now is the time to be ready. Because Jesus is coming soon. May God bless you. And good afternoon again, everybody. We hope you are richly blessed by the program. As you know, God in all seasons, he is in all the seasons, even in America, and even in Trinidad, and here in this post-pandemic in the whole world. Bow our heads for prayer, please. Dear Lord, thank you for this program we went through and we learned, and bless that as we leave here, we would leave it something and some hope to get us through this pandemic. In Jesus' name, amen. 
So you all have a great evening. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and look forward to future programs. See you later.